This is Eric Strong from Stanford University and the Palo Alto Veterans Hospital. This is the first video in a series on disorders of calcium and phosphate metabolism. I'll provide an overview of the normal physiology of calcium and phosphate, and in each subsequent video, I'll cover hypercalcemia, hypocalcemia, hyperphosphatemia, and hypophosphatemia. Understanding the regulation of calcium and phosphate in the human body is a fascinating exercise in synthesizing knowledge from various domains in both physiology and biochemistry. Calcium and phosphate balance exists at the intersection of four separate yet intertwined physiologic systems. The gastrointestinal system, the endocrine system, the renal system, and our musculoskeletal system, or our bones. Calcium and phosphate enter the system through the GI tract. Some is lost in the feces, while some is absorbed into the bloodstream. Both electrolytes undergo continuous exchange with mineral in our bones, as our bones are in a constant balance between resorption and formation, a process sometimes referred to as bone turnover. Both are freely filtered in the glomeruli of the kidney, where some is reabsorbed in the renal tubules, while that which is not reabsorbed is excreted in the urine. The endocrine system uses hormones to mediate the processes of GI reabsorption, bone turnover, and tubular reabsorption in order to keep serum levels of both calcium and phosphate normal despite fluctuations in intake and physiologic need. Pictured here in the dark pink are the four parathyroid glands in the neck which play a critical role in this. For patients in net zero calcium phosphate balance, the amount of calcium and phosphate taken into the GI tract via food must be equal to the sum of that lost in feces and that excreted in urine. Within the body, there are different forms of calcium. At any given time, the vast majority of calcium is stored in the bones as a mineral called hydroxyapatite, which has the chemical formula to the right. The small minority of calcium in the plasma exists in three forms. Approximately 45% is in the free ionized form, Another 45% is bound to proteins, predominantly albumin. The remaining 10% is complexed with circulating anions such as citrate, sulfate, and phosphate. When measuring serum calcium levels, it's important to remember that only the free ionized form is physiologically active. Yet routine blood tests measure the total circulating calcium. While it's possible to measure ionized calcium directly, there are technical limitations and samples require special handling, which decreases precision and increases costs as compared to total serum calcium. Due to the fact that a large fraction of serum calcium is bound to albumin, the serum calcium level should be corrected in states of hypoalbuminemia. The most commonly cited correction formula states that the corrected calcium equals the measured calcium plus 0.8 times 4 minus the serum albumin. Thus, whenever a patient with low albumin initially appears to have low calcium, in practice it usually corrects into the normal range corresponding with that patient having a normal ionized calcium level. As with calcium, there are also different forms of phosphate in the body. Most is also stored in the bones as hydroxyapatite. Of the remainder, most is intracellular as a component of phospholipids in cell membranes, DNA and RNA, and the energy storing compounds of ATP and ADP. The small fraction of phosphate that is in the serum exists as circulating phospholipids and inorganic phosphate. Inorganic phosphate consists of HPO4 and H2PO4 in a 4 to 1 ratio at a pH of 7.40. The sum of HPO4 and H2PO4 is both what is physiologically active and what is typically measured in routine blood tests. A few minutes ago, I mentioned that the endocrine system mediates the processes of calcium phosphate balance using hormones. There are two major relevant hormones. The first is parathyroid hormone, usually abbreviated PTH. This is an 84 amino acid polypeptide, which is produced by the parathyroid glands. Its net effect is to increase serum calcium and decrease serum phosphate. The other major hormone is calcitriol also known as the active form of vitamin D. This is derived from diet or from a cholesterol-derived precursor 
with help from ultraviolet light. Formation of calcitriol also requires enzymatic steps in the liver and kidney. Its net effect is to increase both serum calcium and the serum phosphate. Let me talk a little bit more in depth about each one. PTH is synthesized and is secreted by the chief cells of the parathyroid gland. Its secretion is primarily regulated by serum calcium. Elevated calcium inhibits PTH synthesis and release. Decreased calcium stimulates it. The curve of how PTH secretion relates to serum calcium is important. Over the range of normal total calcium levels of about 8 to 10.5 mg per deciliter, the relationship is relatively linear. However, when serum calcium is below normal, serum PTH secretion is maximized at around 100 uh, picograms per milliliter. No matter how low the calcium gets, a normal set of parathyroid glands will not secrete any more PTH than that. Likewise, no matter how elevated above normal your serum calcium rises, PTH secretion will never be fully suppressed. The role of magnesium in PTH regulation is complicated and not completely understood. In normal physiologic conditions, magnesium impacts PTH secretion in a way parallel to calcium such that small increases in serum magnesium lead to small decreases in PTH secretion and small decreases in magnesium lead to small increases in PTH. However, in states of significant magnesium depletion, there is an impairment in PTH secretion and resistance to PTH action from which hypocalcemia can develop. The details of the synthesis and regulation of calcitriol is significantly more complex than that of PTH. The biggest source of this complexity stems from the fact that each compound and each enzyme has at least two and sometimes three different names which can be used interchangeably and which sound remarkably similar to one another. For this diagram, I'll use my standard notation for physiology diagrams in which physiologic effects will be in green boxes, enzymes in blue, and hormone and prehormones in tan. Let's first consider the prehormone 25-hydroxycholecalciferol, also known as calcidiol. There are two possible sources of this compound. The first is cholecalciferol, also known as vitamin D3. The second is ergocalciferol also known as vitamin D2. There are a few dietary sources of these precursors to active vitamin D. In the US, the major dietary source is supplementation of dairy products and to a lesser extent, cereals and grain products. For some reason, probably historical, most US food companies supplement with vitamin D2. The minor dietary source in the US is naturally occurring vitamin D3 found predominantly in salmon, tuna, and swordfish, and most prominently in cod liver oil. I've heard that D3 may be used more for supplementation in Europe, but I don't know this for a fact. The most prominent source of these vitamin D precursors, however, is not our diet, but rather a steroid-derived compound called 7-dehydrocholesterol, which is converted to vitamin D3 by UV light. That's right, sun striking our skin helps to produce a vitamin. As an interesting historical footnote, in London during the Industrial Revolution, the combination of fog and thick industrial smog led to an extraordinarily high incidence of rickets, a childhood bone disease caused by vitamin D deficiency, possibly the first widespread disease caused by environmental pollution. I'll mention also that the conversion of vitamins D2 and D3 to calcidiol occurs in the liver with the assistance of an enzyme usually called vitamin D 25-hydroxylase, but occasionally also known as cytochrome P450-2R1. The final step in this pathway is the most important and the one that's actively regulated. This is when calcidiol is converted to 125-dihydroxycholecalciferol, also known as calcitriol, or active vitamin D. This occurs in the kidneys and requires vitamin D1-alpha-hydroxylase also known as cytochrome P450-27B1. One alpha hydroxylase is inhibited by calcitriol itself, a form of negative feedback that prevents overproduction of the reaction's product. And an important link between calcitriol and PTH is that PTH increases the activity of one alpha hydroxylase. In addition, low serum phosphate also stimulates this enzyme 
and it's inhibited by high serum phosphate. Finally, there is a protein called fibroblast growth factor 23, or FGF23 for short. Its role in calcium phosphate homeostasis was just discovered about 10 years ago, and the complicated details are still being sorted out. What is known so far is that it's released by osteocytes and osteoblasts in response to PTH and hyperphosphatemia, and one of its primary functions is to inhibit the activity of vitamin D1 alpha hydroxylase. I know all of these names are frustrating, and I wish medicine would just pick one name for each molecule and forget the others, but unfortunately all of these are in common use, and despite this diagram's relative complexity, all of these details are necessary to understanding the diagnosis and treatment of calcium and phosphate disorders. So how does all of this come together in regulating calcium phosphate homeostasis? It starts in the GI tract with absorption of calcium and phosphate into the blood. This absorption is stimulated by calcitriol. From the blood, calcium and phosphate undergo continuous exchange with bone, PTH inhibits bone formation, and stimulates bone resorption, while calcitriol only directly stimulates resorption. There's another hormone to mention here called calcitonin, which blocks bone resorption. Calcitonin is a polypeptide secreted by the parafollicular cells, or C-cells, of the thyroid gland in response to hypercalcemia. The reason it's in parentheses in the diagram, and the reason I haven't yet mentioned it, is because its physiologic role is suspected to be very minimal. Neither thyroidectomy nor thyroid tumors have an appreciable impact on calcium homeostasis. The only reason to even be aware of the existence of calcitonin is due to its potential use as treatment for severe hypercalcemia, which will be discussed in the next video. Besides the process of bone turnover, the other path for calcium and phosphate to take is glomerular filtration in the kidneys. After filtration, PTH stimulates reabsorption of calcium but blocks reabsorption of phosphate, while calcitriol stimulates reabsorption of both calcium and the phosphate. The reason that it's critical for PTH to cause phosphate excretion in the urine is because otherwise, if calcium and phosphate were reabsorbed in equal amounts, they would just complex with one another, leading to no net increase in the free ionized and physiologically active form of calcium. In addition, FGF23 inhibits phosphate reabsorption in the renal tubules, which is probably its most important function. As its expression is stimulated by hyperphosphatemia, this function in the kidney acts as negative feedback to regulate serum phosphate. So in summary, as I mentioned near the beginning, the net effect of PTH is to increase serum calcium and to decrease serum phosphate, while the net effect of calcitriol is to increase both serum calcium and phosphate. An empiric feature of this complex homeostatic system is that both PTH and calcitriol, but particularly PTH, have a greater clinically relevant impact on calcium levels than on phosphate. In other words, it's common for a patient presenting with manifestations of an abnormal calcium level to be ultimately diagnosed with a primary problem of either PTH or calcitriol. However, it's rare for a patient presenting with manifestations of an abnormal phosphate level to be ultimately diagnosed with one of the same. There is one final physiologic mechanism to mention, which further links the endocrine and renal systems. This is the effect of pH on calcium phosphate metabolism. In addition to its regulation by calcium, PTH is also regulated by acid-base status. Decreased serum pH, that is a state of acidemia, leads to increased PTH secretion. PTH acts on the renal tubules to increase urinary excretion of phosphate, which then increases the buffering capacity of hydrogen ions excreted in the late distal tubule. With more hydrogen ions buffered, more hydrogen ions can be excreted, and thus serum pH is increased closer to normal. The last issue I'll discuss here has to do with measuring vitamin D levels. While measuring PTH is very straightforward, vitamin D is not. When measuring vitamin D, one can test for either 25-hydroxyvitamin D, or calcidiol, or 125-dihydroxyvitamin D, or calcitriol. Sometimes both are ordered. 
Potential problems with measuring vitamin D levels include lack of standardization of different assays, lack of consensus on what constitutes a normal vitamin D level, lack of consensus on treatment implications after a low level is detected, confusion among providers regarding the clinical relevance of the different forms of vitamin D. For example, some providers think they are smart in recognizing that it's calcitriol that is the active form of the vitamin, and thus that's the one that should be measured. However, in the absence of renal failure, the presence of which would be obvious, the calcidiol level is actually more sensitive to derangements in vitamin D metabolism as the regulatory mechanisms acting on one alpha hydroxylase can partially compensate for situations such as vitamin D deficiency. This is ironic as the less useful test, which is overordered, is also the more expensive of the two. Which brings us to the last potential problem, the possible lack of cost effectiveness. Based on currently available information, vitamin D levels should only be measured as part of the diagnostic workup of disorders of calcium phosphate homeostasis. They should not be routinely checked in patients with normal levels of calcium and phosphate. That's it for this video on the normal physiology of calcium and phosphate metabolism. As I mentioned at the beginning, the next four videos will cover hypercalcemia, hypocalcemia, hyperphosphatemia, and hypophosphatemia, respectively.